Yeah, you got sensitive teeth though, so it's quite painful. <laughs> I'm gonna offset that with, with some piping hot coffee and it's not gonna hurt even a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of iron in my diet. Um, yeah, it's like um, when you when you go out and you play in the snow and your hands are frozen, and then you come back in, and then you put it under hot water because you think that's somehow going to help, and then it's like the most painful thing you've ever experienced in your life. Yeah, that's what's happening inside my mouth right now. So. Right now. Uh, so, a substitution uh, using u squared, so a u squared substitution, that's weird, we'll talk about that. And then also a disguise log rule. Somehow it's a log rule that is in disguise. That, that's great, because that, that's really telling us that somehow the antiderivative for this one is going to involve a log, but the numerator is definitely not the derivative of the denominator. So. How could that possibly be? Uh, we will see. But let's tackle this one. All right, so it's saying that we're taking, or we're making a substitution using u squared instead of u. And so we want to think about how that would play out. Well, it's actually easier than you might think because really all you're doing is you're taking what you would define as u and defining it as u squared instead, right? So that, that could be easy, or it could be a little bit on the tricky side. So let's just go with our instincts and say that u squared is equal to 16 minus x to the sixth. All right, so that's a possibility. There's, there's actually a better possibility that I'll talk you through in a second. All right, a slightly better possibility. All right, so when we're taking the derivative of something like this, there's, there's a couple of ways to handle it. One way would be to just take the derivative of it as is. So I'm, I'm going to show you a few different approaches here. So I could say 2u times du dx. All right, so it's chain rule, it would be equal to negative 6x to the fifth. All right, and then we can clean that up, but it, it doesn't seem overly helpful at this point. All right, so your first instinct may not get you where you want to go. All right, so that's the unfortunate thing about this. Now, if I tell you that instead of doing that, you can just let the x to the sixth be equal to u squared. So try u squared equals x to the sixth. Right, the benefit of doing this would be that I can actually take the square root of both sides. Previously, I wouldn't be able to. So that's how, it, well, it's kind of a, a step in the right direction of determining how you should define your u squared. Because here, things got out of hand pretty quickly. Right? It's kind of like in regular u substitution. You define u incorrectly, things get out of hand really quickly, and you say, well, okay, well, that didn't work. Let me try something else. Right? How am I going to make a, a substitution using this information? Right? Probably not easily. But here I can just say, well, I'll take the square root of both sides and get u equals x cubed. All right? And again, our only goal when dealing with u substitution is for the derivative of whatever we call u to help cancel out the other part of the integral. All right, so let's see if this plays out. du would be 3x squared dx. Pretty close. One third du would just be the x squared dx. All right, so now I can redefine my integral. All right, so I'll do a little substitution here. I 
We still have a little bit more work ahead of us before it's in the, the ideal form, but we're moving in the right direction. All right, so I have one third du over 16 minus u squared. All right, so that's kind of an issue. Right, because we're looking at something that's very, very close to being the arc sine rule. That 16 is messing everything up. Subtract it, we could. There's actually a rule, and I'll, I'll pull it up for you in a sec. Um, I'll actually pull up the whole set of rules for you because they're, they're nice. They're, there's the one for the sine one, which I can just give you right now, but I'd rather give them all to you in one shot. Let me just rewrite this though. I'll put the one third outside and write it in this form. And let me just get those and I'll send them out to you. Cause it's, um, it's arc sine of u over a, but something I'll show you how to discover in a second. It's, it's actually really cool, the origin story, but I wanted to get the formulas to you. Um, arc, or inverse trig. Actually, you know what? I had a, um, all right, so anyway, if you look at the rule that I just sent out, you'll see that this would be equal to one third arc sine of u over four plus c, and the u is x cubed. Well, let's talk about the, um, the origin of this, this rule. All right, so we'll work with it in completely general terms. It'll be, uh, it'll be magnificent. Let's say we have an integral, and I'll take this too as a um, another. Everybody's like bracing themselves. Um, another typo. Let's say. Well, I'll just write it on the board. Can, well, I'm about to write it here. Uh, include general case. Just write that, and I'll know what it means. All right. All right, so we're looking to integrate this uh, one over the square root of a squared minus u squared. All right, so it, it's a it's basically the most general form of the previous problem. All right, so that that ends up being the integral that would drive the rule. All right, so what we want to do is define basically everything related to this. All right, so the first thing I would want to do is get it into a, a more appropriate form. All right, so it's, it's kind of weird to think about this, but what I'm going to want to do is factor out an a squared. So 
So it becomes one minus u squared over a squared du. All right, so then the, the a would come out of the whole thing. So it would become 1 over a, and then we would have 1 minus, instead of u squared over a squared, I'm going to write it as u over a as a quantity squared du. Actually, I'm just going to double check something to make sure my problem is still good. I believe. Oh, sorry. It needs to be um, U prime on top. So make those U primes. That's the danger of uh, making up a problem on the fly. So what I'm going to do is create a relationship here, right? So, and, and it's basically u substitution, but I've already used u, so I'll create a new variable. I'll call it v is equal to u over a, all right? So that would make v equal to 1 over a u because the, the u part is a function, but the a part is a constant. All right, so we can treat it as a constant multiple. So when I differentiate, I'm going to get dv would be equal to 1 over a du. All right. All right. So then solving for really what I need, which would be the, well, actually, it looks like I have it because this would swap out the a and the du because that's equivalent to this guy. The whole thing would be in terms of v. Well, or at least most of it anyway. They still have the u prime there. Maybe I didn't need that. Well, we're gonna find out in a sec. Because the inner function u would have a derivative, if it is a function, it would have a derivative. <clears throat> Maybe it was better off as a one. All right, well, anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, now it is, yeah, apparently. I just got to figure out, I'm just, tiny little thing in my, in my derivative. Teensy tiny little thing, but major consequences. I, um, I forgot about the chain rule. That's kind of important, as you would imagine. So dv would be equal to one over a u prime du. Yeah, now it's gonna work. Okay, because u is a function. So when I take the derivative of this, it would be the constant multiple times the derivative of u, which is u prime, but then the dv du would allow for the du to be moved over to the right hand side, right? I, missed the u prime because I had already moved the du over there and I thought I had the appropriate amount of stuff. All right, so I needed a one over a u prime du and that's precisely what I have here. So all of that can be replaced with a dv, making that a one. All right, now what would be the antiderivative of one over the square root of one minus v squared dv? Arc sine of v plus c, all right? Now we know that the v is equal to one over 
a u or u over a. Plus C. All right, so got there eventually after I screwed up the original problem that I invented myself, which is weird, and then I screwed up the solution of the problem that I created myself, which is even weirder. So two strikes, uh, one more strike after this, and I think I have to end class because that's my rule. Three strikes and we all go home. You, you'd be excused, of course, from the rest of the day. Make this one throw. Somebody throw a pitch. What's that? The problem is that this has one in the numerator, but you have a U prime. The, the rules I sent you? Yeah. Let me check them. Oh, because they're A squared minus X squared. So the derivative of the x part would be 1. So this is actually a better rule because this would be for any function u. OK, so a better rule would be r sine u over a. The, the, the derivative of that is u prime over radical a squared. Correct. That's a lot. Yeah, it's great. Let's uh, let's do this one, or, or let's do something similar again, minus um, all the hiccups, so that you can get a nice, clean solution from beginning to end without all the. Um... Oh well, that that's a different story. <laughs> oh, I'm just giving away typos today, so we're fine. Yeah, this, this is going to be an arctan situation. <laughs> right, so it, you, you should see a lot of parallels between what we just did and what we're about to do. All right, so the idea being that I don't want a squared plus u squared. I want 1 plus u squared. All right, so it's the same general idea, except I want to factor out an a squared. And there won't be a radical to allow me to simplify. So that's another part of it that you got to deal with. All right, so u squared over a squared times 1 plus u squared over a squared du, which would then become u squared over a squared times 1 plus, as an entire quantity, u over a squared du. And I put squares on the top. So right after I said I was going to do this one cleanly, I screwed something up immediately. Three strikes. Three strikes. Everybody go home. I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to. Sorry. Actually, um, I, I have done that in my college class. Like, I'd be like, all right, time to go home. Like, how far is the class? 45 minutes into a three hour class. <laughs> I was like, you know what? We're already like down three strikes, 45 minutes in, this is going downhill big time. Like, it's just time to call it. So, that's something you could look forward to in college. Well, like, sometimes I hear like professors like cancel the strike for random reason. I hit last one, I could lose instead. Like, yeah, oh, it, it, and unfortunately, sometimes it's because they forgot they had class. Don't you want to learn things in college? You do. Generally, but then when you realize that the professor is not always teaching material that is supposed to be taught in that course because they don't know what class they're supposed to be teaching at that particular time, so they just walk in and start talking about whatever math comes to their mind and then gives a test on whatever the, whatever the subject matter was supposed to be, that, that could be an interesting experience. I had my, my experience, my, my uh, to my everlasting shame, my professor forgot that he had a final exam on a particular day for um, hyperbolic geometry. The problem was I also forgot I had a final exam on that day. So when he finally remembered that he had a final exam, he came in and said, listen, 
my bad. I'm going to make it a group final. So I walked into his office afterwards being like, yeah, so uh, I realized I missed the final. I understand it became a group final. That's cool. Uh, and he was like, yeah, the issue is everyone else took it. That was like me last week. Yeah, except it worked <laughs> out for you. I had no yeah. group. It was very difficult. It was very, very <laughs> difficult. I would have been much easier to take with two or three other people. Um, in fact, it would have been much easier to take under the circumstances that the rest of the class took when he walked into the class, handed out the final exam, said, okay, work in groups of three and deliver it to my office when you're finished and walked out. It became a class final exam. All because I thought it started at 1 p.m. instead of 11 a.m. That was unfortunate. Yeah. That sucked. Anyway. Never made the same mistake since. I've shown up to all of my final exams ever since. That was my last final exam in college, by the way. Honestly, I feel like I'm only a couple of years away from that. <laughs> uh, it, it's going to happen at some point, but I'm not. I'm not quite there yet. Well, like I did an incredible job this year. So, uh, anyway, V equals one over A uh, times U because we're swapping out this. DV would be equal to one over A U prime DU. All right. So we're gonna have a leftover A here. That's not a big deal. We can handle that. Uh, and, and so that, that's part of the fun, I suppose. We want to swap out whatever we can swap out, though. All right. So we can take care of pretty much, really, I mean, if you look at the structure of it, I can take care of one of these A's, the U prime, and the DU, and replace all of that with a, uh, with a DB. All right. So this will be gone. This will be gone and one of these bad boys will be gone. All right, so I'm gonna be left with a one over A, then a one over one plus V squared DV. All right, I'll rewrite it as one over A outside because A is constant. One over one plus V squared DV integrates to what? Arctan of V, but the one, one over A is a coefficient. I almost said one eighth. Eighth. So one over A, arc tan, V is U over A plus C. And there's your rule. Simple, I see. Yeah. Somebody forgot. I can't remember who, though. Anyway, I don't think that one needed a title, but this one I think does because it relies on the concept that we did, um, I guess, Friday. But it was on the previous page. So if it's going to involve a logarithm, the title suggests that a log would be involved, obviously, uh, then the numerator would have to in some way be the derivative of the denominator. All right. So... Following that thought process, it tells us that th there's got to be an e to the x in the numerator, right, in order for that to play out. So what I'm going to do is that nifty trick of adding an e to the x only to subtract it off. The idea being that I can now create the sum or difference of two fractions, in this case 1 plus e to the x over 1 plus e to the x, minus e to the x over 1 plus e to the x dx. All right, the first fraction obviously cleans up nicely. The second one doesn't look so hot, but 
if you ask yourself, is the numerator the, degree, uh, the, the derivative of the denominator, the answer would be yes, because the one would go away, and the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So what we're looking at here is an antiderivative of x minus the natural log of 1 plus e to the x plus c. Normally, I'd put the absolutes in the natural log. But if you consider what you're looking at here, then there's no way for e to the x to be negative. I mean, you, you could do that numerically or just look at the graph. When you create a graph of e to the x, it has a horizontal asymptote at 0. So it looks something like this. So y equals e to the x. It's always positive. All right. Uh, the other thing, the other aspect uh, numerically, would be that you're taking a positive number and raising it to a power. If the power is negative, that just means you're taking the reciprocal of the base. So it's still going to be positive no matter how you slice it. Right? So um, the, the question I usually get is, all right, well, what if I put the absolutes in there? That's not a, that's not a problem. Right? So when in doubt, throw the absolute value brackets around whatever is contained within the logarithm. <laughs> Bless you. Because you can never really go wrong if you do that. Right? It's when you don't include the absolutes and they're needed, that's when you run into trouble. All right. Now, the next one. Uh, if I didn't give you a title for this, and I just said find the antiderivative, you'd be limited to really two possibilities. It would be u substitution or integration by parts. All right. I always suggest you work from the beginning of the course to the end rather than the other way around. Don't look for the most complicated solution to start with. Try the easiest solution. All right. If I'm using u substitution, I would want it to be equal to the natural log of cosine of x. All right. The reason why, I, well, a couple of reasons why I would select this. I, I'll give you three reasons. One, tangent derivative is secant squared. And that, that's definitely not secant squared. So I wouldn't let u be equal to tangent. Uh, cosine, if I took, if I just wanted the cosine, the derivative of that is negative sine. That's not canceling anything out. All right. But I would look at it and say, well, the, the big purpose behind u substitution is to get rid of the really complicated part of the integral. Right? So if you default to that as an, as an approach, then that's probably a good strategy. Because you're taking the most elaborate part of your integral out and replacing it with just a u. Right? If it doesn't pay off, then you know, that, that could happen. But it, it's worth the attempt. Because it would greatly simplify whatever it is you're working with. Now, the derivative, du would be equal to 1 over cosine times negative sine. Negative sine over cosine, negative sine over cosine also known as negative tangent. Negative tangent. As in, like, the thing that we're looking for, mostly. So negative du is equal to tangent x dx. So these two jammy jammies can go away. And we would be looking at negative, just a u, du. All right, so that's what they mean by a disguised power rule. <coughs> Bless you. But I would, I would suggest that anything that involves u substitution is most often anyway, maybe not anything, but most of the things that we use u substitution for, after we make our substitution, boils down to a reverse power rule situation. Okay, so. When in doubt, it's probably one of those things. So antiderivative, negative 1 half u squared plus c. So negative 1 half the natural log of cosine x squared plus c. All right. Uh, just some, some misconceptions to be avoided. Uh, well, I guess by definition you want to avoid them. Some folks in the past have said, okay, well, it's raised to a power of 2, so I can drop the absolutes here. That, that's not necessarily the case, right? Because what we're looking at is the natural log of the cosine. Cosine itself can be positive or negative. Just because you square the natural log doesn't mean that the negative uh, arguments within the, the natural log are going to go away. All right, so in this case, you want to leave pretty much everything there. 
Now, the last one, which is, you know, this is not to scare anyone, but this, I think, is the most challenging one, conceptually, and also um, the, the, the one that people most commonly get wrong on tests. So, uh, and, and we'll talk about it in a sec, but if you really think back to the ones that we've covered, you know, once you made a substitution or a, um, you know, a, a, a quick adjustment to your integral, right, from the word go, it usually became something easy, you know? This is a situation where, and this is why it becomes challenging, you need to know things like, in this case, trig identities, all right? Now, I know in Algebra 2, pre-calc, honors or otherwise, doesn't make a difference, uh, one strategy when dealing with identities was, all right, if, if you can't recognize the identity the way it is, then kick it over to sines and cosines and see if you could do something with that, all right? For these kind of problems, when you see tangent, cotangent, things like that, it, it's, that's probably not gonna be the best way to go, all right? Because there is a relationship between tangent squared and secant squared. Now, we don't know the antiderivative of tangent squared, but we do know that the antiderivative of secant squared is what? Tangent. tangent. So if I can convert this from sine, uh, from um, tangent form into secant form, then I'll, I'll pretty much have what I need, all right? So just a quick review. Pythagorean identity sine squared a plus cosine squared a is equal to what? One. one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I said it and I was like, why is no one else saying it? <laughs> I was thinking the same exact thing. <laughs> but that serves as my exclamation point for uh, the idea of you need to know your trig identities. Uh, it all starts with this one. Right. If I divide each part of this, so if I divide each part by cosine squared, I get a new identity which would be tangent squared a plus one is equal to secant squared. And that's the one we're looking for, all right? So actually we're doing a reverse of what you might do in algebra two. Instead of taking your given expression and converting that into sines and cosines, take a fact related to sines and cosines and convert that into tangents and secants, all right? This is gonna allow us to make a substitution. I'm gonna do a quick uh, adjustment to the equation. Tangent squared A is equal to secant squared minus one. All right, so a nifty substitution right there. And we'd be looking at secant squared of two X minus one DX. So we took something that we could not find the antiderivative of and made it into something that should be pretty easy. Now, you may want to do a little U substitution here if you're not really comfortable with this. But personally, I like using a little baby U sub, which is to say that I know that the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent. It's of 2x, so let me just chuck a 2x in there and then check it real quick. If I were to take the derivative of tangent 2x, what would I get? 2 secant squared 2x. All right, so I don't want the 2, so let me correct for that. All right, and then minus x plus c. All right, that's in lieu of defining a u equal to 2x, taking the derivative and then doing all the substitutions. If you know generally what the antiderivative ought to be, <clears throat> make a note of that and then check it through the differentiation process and you should be able to come up with it. It's a time saver and, and as you know, that's one of the focuses in this course is that the ability to save time because it's, it's a timed exam. Are people usually pushed for time on the exam? They, well, that's the thing. So. <laughs> I have never had a student come back to me and say, I ran out of time. What they say is, I didn't know how to do 20% of the problems on the exam. That's a low percentage. 
Yeah, it's not. It's not terrible. The problem is, they so they burn through the eighty percent that they know how to do, and then they spend the rest of the time available staring at the twenty percent that they don't know how to do. Um, it, and very, you know, it, it's kind of kind of tricky, but you know, I don't know how to say it. It's hardly never my fault. Um, <laughs> no, the, the things that they come back and say, I, I didn't know how to do this. I, I, I have to stare at them with my jaw on the floor. Of like, we've done this like a hundred times in class. Like, yeah, it's I, just I the don't, things I that don't you think that you knew. You just don't know them. Exactly. Yeah. Those are also the students yeah. who are coming back after. Yeah, that's true. So the the overwhelming majority are ones that are not like reporting their experiences. And then I find out later on how they did, and you know, I learned from that also. Um, I have a question about sure. the one above this. So, oh, in the log roll, actually. Going from um, e to the x over 1 plus e to the x to an actual log of 1 plus e to the x. Like, is there a rule written now? Yeah, uh, we, it's in the first page of your packet, but I'll write it up on the board again because it's so important. It's the derivative of the natural log of u is equal to u prime over u. And so the reverse of that would be the antiderivative of u prime over u du would be the natural log of u plus c. Plus c. Plus c. Every time. Okay. 